we're not that far from the future that we see in science fiction uh, these days. And education, no longer, you spoke also about education. No long, education is no longer literacy, and literacy is no longer just reading and writing. I think we need a new, new principles for digital uh, literacy. How do we distinguish what is right, what is fake, and what is true? And I think in the world where sensationalism and hate, as you said, uh, and anger are the most easy to, to, to spread, the United Nations Secretary General actually from also this room launched uh, last week a United Nations action plan to combat hate speech. And I think this is something that the United Nations is aware of and I think we want to be on the front lines for, for fighting hate speech. So now uh, I would like to invite Dr. David Silverzweig, uh, Chairman of the Psychiatry at Bri uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, uh, where he also co-directs the Center for the Neurosciences. Please, you need to press the button. Yeah, there you go. Thank you very much, and thank you, David, for a broad and deep discussion. Uh, and uh, Fabrizio and also Mariko for your comments. I'd like to build upon those comments from the vantage point that uh, that I have as a physician, as a psychiatrist, neurologist, uh, neuroscientist, educator. Um, uh, I will first say that um, you know to be here today to celebrate and to participate in the UN uh, is really uh, very special, and and I think that the um, you know with the film that we saw, if my uh, family had stayed in Europe, I wouldn't exist probably. Uh, and uh, so I think you know as we try to transcend the atrocities that we saw on the film, uh, it's exceedingly important that we, uh, for everybody in every group um, throughout the world, particularly disadvantaged or disenfranchised groups, that we uh, learn the lessons of history. And, and perhaps um, with AI and the internet, um, we can achieve something that humanity hasn't been able to achieve, which is sort of transgenerational learning. Um, uh, this was sort of alluded to, and uh, the fact that each generation seems to have to go through wars um, when they forget the horror, um, maybe uh, we, can, we can do something uh, about that with organizations like the UN, with, uh, with the digital revolution that we've been talking about, and with this confluence of uh, the UN and uh, academia. Uh, so I, I want to salute Ranu and, and thank you, and also Tuan uh, for the Boston Global Forum uh, that, uh, and AI uh, World Society that I'm part of. Um, I think that we are in an era right now where um, we're on the defensive in terms of the UN or the or academia um, and we have to help people understand that the the dangers and threats or the stoking of fears uh, that was described that people engage in um, uh, around global organizations or around academia and so-called uh, the elites and and so forth uh, that in fact um, we have to participate a mentor of mine um, Jack Barkas uh, used to say when we were dealing with um, particularly difficult issues or particularly difficult people, he would just turn to me and say, David, we're an imperfect species. And uh, that sort of summed it up uh, rather well. And John Kemeny, uh, who was the president of Dartmouth when I uh, graduated, made a speech uh, about how important it was that people had technical and scientific literacy that uh, in order to be citizens, not just uh, for vocational purposes or educational purposes, that the world was going to change. Uh, and he was certainly right as one of the inventors of BASIC, one of the first computer languages, um, in a way that you have to be educated in and sophisticated in to understand. Um, otherwise, you're more likely to be manipulated um, otherwise, you're more likely to not eat, to have your own free will hijacked, um, which is a really interesting phenomenon in terms of the brain mind. 
uh, the most nefarious sort of manipulation, obviously, is when um, people or uh, corporations make you want to do something that they want you to do. Um, and you think that it's your own, um, uh, or you come to believe or feel that it's your own volition. How does that work in the brain? How does the brain get hijacked and how do we protect it? Indeed, how does the brain sort of handle all of this? Because artificial intelligence, in fact, is based upon human intelligence in the first instance. And our brains evolved in a way that over millions of years um, is being, uh, is both a model for AI um, as well as uh, is being manipulated by AI right now. As you go deep in the brain to areas that are phylogenetically older, evolutionarily, the processing is more automatic. It's unconscious. Not in the old psychoanalytic sense of unconscious, but unconscious in the sense of automatic processing that's not amenable to conscious awareness. It's, um, it's more involuntary and reflexic more stereotyped, those responses. Whereas as you go to newer, more evolved parts of the neocortex in the brain, especially the prefrontal cortex, which has evolved tremendously in our species, you get to more conscious, voluntary, flexible thinking. And one way of sort of uh, construing some of the lessons of today uh, is, uh, is that um, we have to enhance frontal lobe functions. We need AI because it, there's this balance between the sort of top-down executive, rational, um, empathic control that our brain is capable of and the sort of bottom-up phylogenetically, phylogenetically older, reflexic, uh, defensive, um, aggressive, uh, sort of processing. And so the way I look at it, we sort of need to tip the balance. And as um, Maher alluded to, you know, these days, in fact, we're getting to the brain computer interface and the work that we and colleagues do entails trying to decode neural network computations, if you will, or processing then feed it to AI, crunch those numbers, and in a way that is real time, can feed back into the human brain uh, signals that can help modulate in a therapeutic way um, to overcome paralysis or to overcome crushing depression or obsessive compulsive disorder or things like this. Um, if you think about the moral machinery that we have in our brain, and the need to enhance the pro-social as opposed to the anti-social processing and behavior and decision-making that we have as human beings. Um, this is where we have either the danger of AI or the hope of AI, probably both. And so that we have to work in a transdisciplinary fashion to, um, to be able to transcend this sort of in-group, out-group um, distinction that was talked about. We evolved in groups of 40 plus people, extended family, and your brain, it was an adaptive advantage if you cooperated with the in-group and if you were suspicious of the group on the other side of the mountain uh, who could come and take your resources, kill you, uh, and, and so forth. Um, and the problem is that society and culture have evolved a lot. Technology has certainly evolved a lot, but we're still uh, stuck with the same apparatus. So how do we combine all of this? Um, well, we can take advantage of what we're learning in academia um, and take advantage of social neuroscience. Um, neuroscience mostly was sensory motor, the study of, of moving or seeing. And then in the 1980s, it became possible to understand cognition, memory, language. In the 1990s, it became respectable to understand the neurobiology of emotion. And then in the 2000s, the neurobiology of social 
uh, processing. How is it that we as an organism or an individual can represent in our brain minds the fact that another organism has a brain mind and has their intentions, let alone their rights and possibilities and dreams and hopes and fears? Um, how is it that we make moral decisions? How is it that, um, that when it's your in-group, your moral threshold is one level, but if it's the out-group, all of a sudden, uh, people are willing to, um, uh, to do things that otherwise they would never even conceive of, often in the name of ideologies or religions or, uh, or nationalism, uh, etc. And so, in a way, what we really need to do is make the whole world the in-group. Um, and of course, that's what the United Nations is designed to do. We need to be able to not tolerate intranational um, disasters and uh, authoritarianism and get to the point where we can um, bring enough people along and empower these organizations um, together with the other existing forms of governance uh, to be able to, um, to, uh, to get beyond sort of smaller notions of identity where fears can be stoked and, uh, and get towards a broader um, humanistic set of values and principles um, and, uh, and governance with uh, consequences that will uh, allow us to make sure that AI as it grows in its capabilities and as it uh, develops hidden layers that we are not even uh, able to understand the nature of in terms of what algorithm uh, is, being, uh, is transpiring that we remember that uh, as, our, as human beings that we need to control that, that it has to be for the common good. Hence the AI, the Boston Global Forum work on, um, uh, on trying to develop an ethics of AI um, and a set of principles and buy-in. Um, finally, I, I, I'd just like to say that, you know, as, again, as David mentioned, and he touched upon so many really critical themes, there's always going to be that small percentage of the population that are bad actors. As a physician, I will say that surgeons are not antisocial. Um, they, uh, they, may, um, they may have uh, more steely emotions, uh, but, they, but their moral emotions are very high. Uh, but the people who are sociopathic and psychopathic, um, who literally don't respond the way most people do to the suffering of another human being, uh, and or the people who, for reasons of greed and power and, and so forth, um, will act in bad faith. Um, I, I think that's really critical as well, because we can have organizations and laws and governance, but what do we do about the, the state or non-state actors um, who are not obeying the rules, who are being aggressive? How do we address that in terms of the overall human population? I think unless we... Um, figure out some way to either deter or address that, then you know, we'll, most of the people, most of the time, will be good. Uh, but as we heard increasingly, uh, individuals and small groups, let alone states, have, uh, have terrible power. So uh, I don't want to end on a, on a dystopian note, and so I will uh, you know, come back to health and public health um, and to the notion that, um, that mental health is health and uh, the brain is the organ of the mind, and the way we treat each other um, is the beginning and the end of it, and the way in which we as a species um, decide to use and develop AI and to deploy it uh, and to govern it will be, uh, will be critical for our future. So uh, thanks. Thank, thank you, David, and I think you reminded us about the importance of studying the brain and how we function, at least for now, the brain we know, before they implant with technology and AI. And I think for people working in communications, uh, we are aware of studies that show that basically the only thing that's common amongst us, no matter where we grow in our culture, is storytelling. We all enjoy a good story. We all like to learn from stories. As children, even as adults today, we see a film that is a story. And stories give us pleasure. And I think 
research has shown that a good story can actually trigger the same pleasure in your, in your mind uh, as, as anything that pleases you. Uh, the same way pleasure does uh, the ability to excite the neurons that make dopamine and stimulate the creation of oxytocin, which is the chemical that promotes pro-social empathetic behavior. I think for us, as communicating on behalf of the United Nations, I think we need to use these tools more by telling stories that people get, to, and then they change their beliefs and, and the way they, more than data. I think we can show all the graphs to somebody who's a climate skeptic, they will not believe it. The minute they see something, uh, extreme weather conditions that is impacting them and affecting somebody they love and affect, that might change their mind. So, thank you. So now I turn to a friend and colleague, uh, Atif Ariyazi, the United Nations Assistant Secretary General uh, and Chief Information Technology Officer for the United Nations. Atif, Atif. Thank you very much, Maher. Um, first of all, I have to welcome all of you to this wonderful room and to the UN. It's always great to um, have academia here. Um, we uh, need to reach out a lot more often um, to our partners, to the private sector, to academia as we look at these complex issues. Um, and I'm, I'm really privileged to be sharing this panel with my distinguished colleagues. Thank you for being here. Um, and, um, and it was wonderful listening to you, David. It was, I mean, you challenged us and, and you posed so many questions to us which as I was sitting here thinking as a CIO of the UN, as you posed them, I was thinking, what am I going to do about that? <laughs> and how am I going to solve that? So I am I'm filled with questions at this point, and, and I'd like to pose some more questions because I know you guys have the answer to those. Uh, but I want to reflect on something you said, uh, which just caught my attention, about 14 billion devices, <clears throat> 14 billion. You know, we've, we've moved from being a homo sapien to homo mobilis to connected sapiens. And, and we, are not, we are not this species we were before. And it was mentioned one of my panelists about, you know, very soon we, we will be a combination of silicon and carbon, not only a carbon creature. And we don't really know what that species would think about and, and react and act. And I think this is a turning point for us to, to think about that. And, and, but, but 14 billion devices also says something else to me. It says um, 14 billion contact points at risk, because when we think about cyber crime, cyber risk, identity theft, um, whoa, how, how do governments manage that? And why do governments have to manage that? Why is it that the responsibility of all this stuff has to fall on governments, UN NGOs, when the private sector is benefiting tremendously from all of this. And I, and I want to come back to that, because that's a big question. Maher said, we wish we had the, the, the member states in this room. Yes, uh, we need member states in this room, but we need the private sector in this room, because this has just gone too far, and as a CIO, I see the advancements of technology. We benefit tremendously from it, uh, not as much as the private sector, but we also have to deal with the consequences. Um, as Fabrizio said about this kind of impact, the negative impact of technology, we have to deal with that on a day-to-day -day basis internally and, and with our member states. So 19, 14 billion devices says, what is our program around e-waste? because it's easy to sell the devices and it's easy to buy them, but the impact of mercury, lead, I mean, this impact on water, on land, it's tremendous, and it's tremendous in the developing markets, and it's tremendous on women. It's, the biggest impact is on women, because you know, as women are dismantling these devices with their bare hands, and, and mercury is something that your body mistakes for calcium. And as you're, you get pregnant, you deliver, um, it would go right into your child. So, so do we think about how do we get together in a room and talk about the impact of innovation? Because we benefit from it, but we never think about impact. And what we think about is, or oh, the governments would deal with that. 
Globally, the private sector creates about $30 trillion. The governments, UN, NGOs, $3 trillion. But all these issues are left to the governments to deal with when they don't benefit from the profit. And, and that's the key question. That's the big issue. 14 billion devices. We're only talking about mobile devices. We're not talking about cyber risk. We're not talking about e-waste. And we're not talking about where the responsibility lies because assumption is it's with government. So it's really important to have those conversations. Um, you know, when I, when I read that, it was wonderful to, to, to read the charter. And, and when I read the charter and, and I read, you know, the reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights and the dignity and worth of human person, when I read the word justice um, and social progress, scourge of war, I think about all of those terms in a cyber sense, right? Because we've moved from the physical world to the cyber world, but we still deal from a, from a crime, from a security, from protection, from laws, we still think about them in a physical sense. And that doesn't necessarily work. Laws in a physical world do not stop um, money laundering in a dark web because nobody frankly cares what laws we have. And the government's ability to, uh, to find who is doing it, to, for the, for the court's ability to bring those to justice is non-existent. That's how difficult it is. So, and, and 74 years ago, technology wasn't, no one was thinking about technology, right? And today the world has tremendously changed. So when we think about peace, peace and security in a cyber world, it's something very different. We see cyber intrusions every day to member states. The industrial systems, which are 40 years old, which got this old technology, have been all connected to the internet. And because they're connected to the internet, they are extremely vulnerable. The utility system, water system, transportation system, military, financial system, they're all very vulnerable to cyber attacks. And cyber attacks are happening every day. And it's not necessarily governments. These are actors that are unknown. You can never find out who they are. Now, how do we ensure peace and security in this world? How do we do that? Because, you know, it, it to me goes back to causality, and we talked a little bit. We as technologists, we as innovators, have this great sophistication about technology and innovation. But we have a much lesser sophistication to understand the impact social impact, financial impact, organizational impact, political impact, not five years from now, but 20 years from now, 50 years from now. And it is not getting better. It is getting worse because that dialogue is not taking place. Technology is just innovating. I think this is the innovation is uh, you, you, you can't kind of curtail innovation. Right? You, you choke its vitality. Innovation is happening, and innovation is happening in a, in a very kind of horizontal level. Um, and, and we can't think about sitting in this room and coming up with laws, because they won't work. We can't implement them. Um, and, and, and the question for us is, how do we innovate responsibly? How do we make sure that when we, we innovate something 40 years from now, we don't see its negative impact. Because it's not like the hiss of Titanic. It takes time. It takes a long time for its impact. Um, if, we, if you think about the 20th century, 20th century, we had two world wars. We had a Cold War. We had antibiotics. We sent a man to the moon. We had the biggest innovation was the internet, really. We got connected. And it brought great prosperity to so many. We talked about wealth distribution, right? Actually, wealth has shifted, um, which poses its own new questions with AI and projected mass unemployment. I mean, we already have 50% of youth unemployment, right? And if you begin to think about the impact of technology on employment, that number could escalate. 
And we know what happens with radicalization of youth. And, and, and these are the issues as, as we, you think about technology and innovation and AI, these are the questions that UN thinks about. How do we deal with employment, unemployment? How do we deal with unrest? Would there be enough jobs? So when you think about um, the, the internet and its impact, we could have never envisioned that, that peace and security will completely change. Crime will change. Today, uh, the, 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 the largest criminal enterprise is really drug trafficking, right? Four trillion dollars shifted to the dark web and through cryptocurrency. So the government's ability to track that is minimum. If you think about human trafficking, which is 80% women, 50% children, it's about, I think, 46 million modern day slaves. Most of commerce happens through the dark web. How do we influence that? And as we sit here, it's governments and NGOs and UN, we think about how do we do that. The private sector's position is, it's not my problem. It's your problem and the governments are crippled. So how do we as humanity think about those issues which are exploding? and begin to come up with ways to address them because technology is amoral and, and, and the fact is that the, the rules and regulations and governance we had is not embedded in logic. And as David Hume said, you know, good and bad are perceptions of our mind, right? And he talked about causality, cause and effect. And we don't really know what good and bad is. Good and bad to you is something very different to me. And good and bad today is very different 10 years from now. So how do we ensure that we can have, uh, we can uphold human dignity, human respect, trust? When you think about identity theft, I think less than 1% um, of, of uh, the criminals being caught. When you think about human trafficking, I think only 10 countries have had one or two cases on human trafficking because it's become so difficult. When you think about the impact on deep fake content, that's just not true. And, and, and your, right to, your right as a human being, as a citizen to true content versus fake content. Um, how do we address those issues? Social media and terrorism, we saw a lot of it with ISIS and ISIL, right? Their ability to radicalize youth. Whose responsibility is it? To, uh, to address those issues because you can't really regulate the internet. Those people who think we can have policies and regulate, it will never happen. But how do we as a society begin to have space that upholds those basic, basic human issues that are raised here? How do we do that? And I, and I guess what, I, what I'm thinking about is not only the UN. The UN of today, with the impact of technology, is very different than the UN of 74 years ago. We have to build and sustainable development goals, lots of wonderful goals, 17 goals. The most critical goal was number 17, which talks about partnership. And it's through that partnership, it's through having you in this room, it's through having the private sector, it's through having the member states in this room to talk about these issues because we collectively own them and the private sector owns a big chunk of them because that's the only way we can begin to have responsible innovation. It's the only way that we can predict better because it's really difficult to predict. You know, you think about the impact of single combustion engine and the impact on the environment today. No one could have envisioned the, the changes the society would see with suburbia, changes in land, water, um, disease, environment from a single innovation of a single combustion engine. So, and our ability is limited. I mean, as, 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 as humans, we, we can't, we judge the future based on what we know today. And that judgment is flawed because technology is changing so much. It is this, this exponential growth and as Fabrizio said, it'd probably be the slowest time of our uh, history. But our, our governance, our rules, our policies, they don't move as fast. So there is this gap. 
And I think that's why we're seeing this, uh, this huge growth in criminal activity, which we just governments and, and the sectors cannot, cannot deal with. Um, within the UN, we're trying to have, we're deploying certain initiatives to address some of that. Um, we're deploying what we call App Store for Social Good because we like, we've seen so many apps for uh, which the private sector benefits the private sector, but we think we need to use technology for social good. So we're deploying that. We encourage everyone to participate, where we develop solutions to address big issues around SDGs. We're deploying innovation labs, which is these labs are designed to bring academia, private sector, government, and UN together to innovate in, to, in addressing social issues. Again, it's around technology. Um, we're deploying a program we call Digital Blue Helmets. These are our cyber experts who support the UN and, uh, and support our substantive side of our operation to build cyber expertise. Um, departments such as UN ODC, which deals with drugs and um, crime, departments like UN Disarmament, Peace and Security, their, their roles change tremendously due to cyber crime. We support them. Um, we have a program called Unite Ideas where we put initiatives up for challenge. We invite you to come. These are initiatives that we're doing on the substantive side and we need support. And of course, analytics and AI. These are a big part of what we are investing in. The technology as it aggravates is also mitigates. It's like the Clean Air Act, right? You had the London fog in 1950-51 and then you had the Clean Air Act. So we think positively, although, as I say, our understanding is pessimistic, our willingness is optimistic. So we think positively that we can overcome and we can have use technology for the good of humanity, but we can only do it together. Um, I'd just like to close with, um, with just a couple of few points. That science and technology is overflowing the boundaries of our existing regulatory framework. It has. And our reliance on that is, is, uh, is not effective. So we need new models where we can operate. I think moral accountability of our actions, of our innovation is critical. And that's something that I always share with my colleagues in the private sector, to think about that. Uh, the unpredictability of innovation um, is there. We just cannot predict the future, but we have to plan for it anyway. We have a paradox in the tech world. We, we always think about hardware, software, tools. The fact is that it's about its impact on the society, on a culture, um, and on our way of life. Um, and I think we need to um, we need to remember what Francis Bacon said. You know, he said that the aim of uh, science was man's ultimate goal to overcome the power that he had lost at the fall. Um, his pursuit for salvation, and and. And, and if that's, you know, that's our aim as, as human beings, we, we have to be very conscious about responsibility and responsible innovation together um, and be able to uh, create a world uh, which, which will um, address a lot of the social issues and plan for things that we could impact uh, the way of life, including the environment um, and all the all the issues that we that was raised in the charter here. So thank you so much again for being here. We love having you here uh, at the UN. Thank, thank you, Arvind. You, you mentioned drugs. And today actually is World Drug Day. And I, and I know from uh, having worked in the UN Office for Drugs and Crime. So this is a day also for us to remember the victims of the drug trade that, that is now using the dark web to what do you call it, uh, wash their money and, and, and then use it in other, other forms. You also spoke about war and cyber war. I think we know what a war looks like. We can see, we saw from the images of the Second World War, we see conflicts in, in different parts of the world today. There was the Cold War, but there is now what people call the Cool War. Cool War is happening as we speak. 
cyber attacks from one country against another, cyber attacks by non-state uh, non actors. Uh, it, is I mean, it is called cool war. It is happening. And the danger is, what is the threshold that a country will say, that's gone too far, I'm going to retaliate with real war, uh, weapons of real war. So these are all questions that I think are being discussed in this house. And I think this is, goes back to what I quoted before. Is it's the power of principles transcending, changing perception of expediency, of political expediency. That can ground us in a future that is more, uh, more principled. So let me now give the floor to our last panel speaker, uh, Dr. Ajit Narayan uh, Mathur, <coughs> Professor of Strategy in Strategy and International Business, concurrently affiliated uh, to Economics and Business Policy Areas, Indian Institute of Management, uh, Ahmadiyabad. Please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a real privilege, honor, and delight uh, to be here on the occasion of the 75th anniversary of the Charter Day. Uh, much has been said about the concerns that uh, arise from the way technology evolves and the way technology would be used. And I'm reminded of uh, Norbert Wiener, who was uh, the person who coined the term cybernetics. He had already cautioned way back uh, uh, when he was working at the frontiers of cybernetics that the critical issue would be human uses of human beings and how we are going to engage with those human uses of human beings. Uh, walking into this uh, room, I was handed a book which uh, on the cover says, Words Matter. And it made me think that uh, actually more than words, what matters is the pictures of relatedness that we hold. Because it's these pictures of relatedness that we hold that are the driving force unconsciously of how we conduct our journeys. Because human lives are largely journeys which are propelled by forces which we are not aware of. And only hesitantly and cautiously we occasionally nudge them at uh, the points of forks and intersections when we encounter rational intent. So it's uh, quite important for us to pay attention to what we don't know or what we are not aware of. And uh, uh, I was struck by the chair's uh, attention to the stories around campfires, because one of the reasons why campfires are important are that legends and myths and stories and sharings enable us to express the desire to connect to a larger body than our own. The desire to belong to a community larger than our own. And I believe these are the very values and principles behind the uh, creation of the United Nations. I'm not so convinced that technology will change human nature. The, there are infinite changeless realities of human nature that have arisen over time and uh, the, beneath the surface of constant change, evolution and transformations, it is that human nature that uh, is quite important to pay attention to because the pictures of uh, relatedness that we hold today and the pictures of relatedness that we hold in 2045, are they going to be very different? Where are we now? We have the possibility to look at the UN Charter in one of two ways. We could look at it as a document that embodies hope over despair from a salvationist perspective uh, about the world as it can be or the world as it should be. But an alternative would be to look at the UN Charter as an invitation to a dialogic inquiry into the politics of revelation and an intergovernmental body is bound to have enormous amount of politics of uh, revelation involved in its processes. So if we are able to engage in that uh, dialogic inquiry into revealing the world as it actually is, it's possible that we might be able to then recognize patterns and processes and facilitate transformations so that the normative that we are preoccupied with uh, can also be supplemented by the existential, the phenomenal, and the hermeneutic. And then the Charter can remain relevant for a long, long time. Many things have been read into the Charter that are not there in print. For example, peacekeeping itself was a discovery along the way. 
and it was created by the initiative of the Secretary General of the UN when there was no such provision in the Charter. But he was able to read into Articles 5, 6, 7 uh, the possibilities of uh, uh, interpreting. So I'd also like to highlight that institutions and systems are not systems of computation. So I couldn't be bothered how many digital devices exist in the world. It doesn't matter. What matters is what those systems of uh, interpretation uh, create as meaning-making processes, because the systems of computation can only generate information. It is systems of interpretation that will generate meaning. And in order to get to meaning, we need to really look at where we are now. We have reached the point where Rudyard Kipling's uh, story about uh, as easy as ABC, the drones that will control the world, uh, has almost come true. Uh, we are already in the era of uh, driverless vehicles being na navigated by GPS systems, uh, mutating microorganisms that can be introduced to create biological warfare anywhere on the planet with great ease. Uh, water scarcity, which is a reality in many parts of the world. There is also complexity driven by techno-commercial considerations. So when David was uh, referring to the power of technology, uh, I was uh, wondering if we should look at it as a triangle. One side is society, one side is the economics, and one side is technology. Or rather the corners are society, economics, and technology. Then along the lines that connect the dots of the triangle, you would get a techno-economic side. And this techno-economic side, the techno-commercial side, is now about multi-sided markets. It's being driven very largely by what we call the FANG economy. And the FANG economy is the Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. And these uh, large uh, organizations are then controlling or regulating the rest of society and whether one could actually bring them into the discussion as civil society, I don't know. I'm not so sure about that. Because those who are already in the modality of winner takes it all, then uh, the question of involving them uh, would seem like a great concession to those who they believe have become losers and lost it all. But we do need to pay attention to the socio-technical side of the triangle. The socio-technical side of the triangle has always demonstrated that technology has never outright won anything. It's always been a combination of the viable, sustainable socio-technical system. Right from the industrial age, when we had the long wall method of coal mining, which failed. It was definitely the most efficient method, but it failed. The, similarly, the, uh, the, in the textile industry, the two conventional industries that marked the industrial era, the foreloom uh, to the weaver, that also failed. So what actually uh, came as insights, and that's how the socio-technical systems theory was born, uh, when we realized that technology is not everything. There's also the socio-economic side of it. The complexity, of course, has outgrown the pace of our capacity to govern, our capacity to regulate, our capacity to manage system structures and processes. And this has already been flagged by panelist Atif Riyazi just before me. What is also important is that we are not able to recognize where we have come from. Uh, in the international system, we have an international institution called the ILO, which is the only tripartite body. It was created by the Treaty of Versailles and it was actually a response to the Bolshevik Revolution. Uh, and that part was never remembered until after the uh, Cold War got over, when the Soviet Union disintegrated, and then people in the ILO woke up and said, why do we exist? What is our reason for being here? Yes, we have a charter, we have, a, we have uh, all that, but uh, we don't have a purpose anymore. Because the purpose, if it had been only about the response to the Bolshevik Revolution, that purpose was already over. The identity crisis that institutions can face is important. Today's identity crisis is about loss of civil society. It's about loss of countervailing power. It's also about the incapacity to be able to work with consumers, to be able to work with natural persons having promoting their rights 
over artificial juridical persons, the balance has completely tilted in favor of artificial juridical persons. We also have uh, zillions of uh, working non-employees on the planet, what we may call the precariat. They are, they are workers, but they are not employees. So the crisis of jobs has almost reached humanitarian emergency proportions. And I believe that one of the actions that the UN should consider is, like we created the International Red Cross, the committee was created long back, uh, we probably need a body like that called the International Blue Cross. Now, one year after the internet, in 1994, the UN system had conducted a series of studies on the future of work. And uh, one of the papers I had contributed to that work was a proposal to create an international blue cross because one could see already then that full employment equilibrium will never be achieved. Full employment had already become an impossibility in 1994. But we have neglected that because nobody is prepared to admit that full employment it will never happen again. All our economics has been based on the modeling of full employment equilibriums, but we are not in equilibrium. No economist anywhere on the planet can any more predict economic growth, any more than any financial expert can predict uh, the business cycles. Nobody can say definitely that there won't be a financial crisis in 2020. And nobody can say that there will be. So when we are not able to even see at this distance in time, Imagine trying to make sense of what will happen in 2045. Because what's really happened is that the cyclical nature of cycles uh, has ceased to have any significance. We don't have any cycles that we can claim with definite uh, purpose. Uh, structural adjustments, which was the hallmark of World Bank and uh, IMF-led stabilization methods, have also failed. In fact, they've failed more often than they've succeeded. Because the nature of the economies and the nature of societies is no longer governed by structural maladjustments. It's about systemic failures. And these systemic failures are about technologies that are associated with increasing returns to scale and our obsession with measurements. Because while our obsession with measuring things has increased, our capacity to understand that there are unmeasurable phenomena that also affect unmeasurable things has decreased. And I, I think we really need to look at uh, what not knowing might bring. Because not knowing can generate two responses. It can generate anxiety. And if it generates only anxiety, it'll lead to a clutter of data collection. It'll lead to some false knowing being created and people being led to action on the basis of that false knowing. Imagine if a doctor found something wrong with a patient and said, fine, I've found what is wrong, and now I can uh, treat the patient, the doctor would not fail to discover what else could be wrong with the patient. The patient can have as many diseases as the patient is capable of having. It's not enough to spot only those uh, uh, singularities and say that uh, we know that we can now interpret and work with that. So I'm saying that the nature of risks has changed. Cyclical risks, which were a function of time, no longer exist. Structural risks, which had to do with partitioning of tasks, this is one of the black holes of management. There is no theory in management which would tell you how to partition tasks in any system. And this is one of the mysteries that uh, we still work with. Systemic risks are about toxicities that arise in institutions and organizations. We are just beginning to have an understanding of uh, how toxicities accumulate. And these toxicities accumulate because they accumulate over claims, grievances, disputes, differences, conflicts, which are left unresolved as agendas, which then produce what I call process risks of willful blindness and neglect of the psychodynamic properties in the collective unconscious. One of my colleagues on the panel spoke about the brain. I don't want to draw him into a discussion on the mind and the brain here, but I would like to point out at least one important uh, difference between the way I would look at the phenomena and the way he looks at it, which is that uh, when we look at the phenomena from the perspective of psychoanalysis, then we are not so concerned about the individual, because if we are looking at collective phenomena, we can also notice that uh, people like Wilfred Bean and others have discovered 
that there are collective defenses that can be unconsciously erected and which can come in the way of rational intent and solving problems with actions. Three of the defenses that Bian had identified, one was about dependency. And religion is one of them that has always produced a lot of dependency problems to be solved through that. The army, on the other hand, represented the fight-flight uh, dimension, and pairing represented the elites or the aristocracies. E even in this day and age, when we look at uh, 75 years of the UN, is 75 years too short a period to say that we don't know or we can't uh, diagnose problems? And if it is, then what is needed to diagnose those problems so that uh, we don't have intractable uh, problems that have no expiry date and have become so wicked problems that they keep getting discussed in perpetuity. There are lots of international issues uh, that have been hanging for at least 25 years without any solution. And I can speak of several of them. One of them is the uh, committee that's working on uh, traditional knowledge, genetic resources, and cultural expressions. Hasn't produced its final uh, uh, output. Uh, similarly, the, the trade talks that they were launched uh, in Doha, they're still not concluded. The, so globalization is itself uh, a question mark at the moment because foreign direct investment in the last six years has not been increasing. It's stagnant. It's uh, in, even going down in many parts of the world. So what we are dealing with is the kind of issue that comes from uh, the obsession that we have with uh, the disconnect from the passions that may be really be driving us. For example, if uh, we, uh, there was a reference made to ethics and moral judgments, if psychically impoverished and morally blinded populations begin projecting the capacity for moral judgment to their leaders, would peace and liberal democracy stand a chance at all? So I think we really need to worry about uh, the conditions under which Identifying with groups or communities or sects uh, when people would be ready and become willing for dissolving the walls between themselves and other collectivities. Because the kind of issues that are lying and lurking as invisible, how do we make these issues visible? How do we make, how do we articulate what has not been articulated? How do we own the disowned? Because there's a lot of disowning going on. How do we enact the withheld? And where do we belong? I'm sometimes surprised that on uh, occasions like this, we forget that we belong to the planet. Uh, I'm glad that uh, the speaker, David, uh, spoke about the dot of Carl Sagan. The question also is that if we belong, then how come? We still carry a sense of uh, I and the other. And this is something that arises in the process of growing up because we cannot develop a sense of identity without developing a sense of the other. Uh, this, uh, uh, this is uh, one of those truths uh, which is self-evident and which perpetuates what one may call the reinforcement to hatred. Because hatred is painful. Hatred is rather difficult to tolerate or integrate and manage even in ourselves. And so we need prejudices. And there's this need for prejudices to maintain an enemy into whom we can project our hatred. So we actually hate our neighbors as we hate ourselves. And uh, this uh, edict about uh, loving your neighbor as you love yourself, I think we also ought to reflect on why we hate our neighbors as we hate ourselves, because we disown the hatred inside of us and we project it to figures that are outside of us. The difficult part here is that when a system is very far from equilibrium, and the world system in many ways is very, very far from equilibrium, there will always be discontinuous change with new structures of greater complexity arising. And to work with those uh, discontinuous changes with uh, complexity that is uh, constantly challenging us, we would need the capacity to proactively work with such changes with some kind of safety in containment. And it's only a body like the UN that can provide that safety in containment as an international organization uh, to be able to work with uh, these issues. 
the kind of uh, polarities that we experience and the kind of uh, dimensions on which it occurs is, is itself uh, something to worry about because uh, uh, if, if we can make the trickles to come alive, we might be able to start new streams of connections. So the digital part of the technology can be very useful here. So I'll conclude by saying that if you believe that uh, small streams can connect, then please start small streams, join with others, let others join you, and let the whole thing expand. But if our belief is that only the paranoid survive, then everyone may die prematurely. Thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, Ajit. Fabrizio had to leave us. He excused himself, and I think it was really great that he would stay, stay with us for uh, two and a half hours. I'm amazed you're staying here. The weather outside is great. It's not scorching hot like in, in Europe, uh, but we're happy about that too. Uh, you spoke about, I mean, as an economist, uh, you spoke about, of course, economy and, and the benefit uh, that what businesses do, but you also mentioned the planet, and I like that. Because we often, in our calculations and in our aspirations to improve the good of humans, we forget the planet. And that's what we have done for the last, since the Industrial Revolution. And that's why we have the climate change epidemic. This room that we're in is the Economic and Social Council. As if you look up, for those of you new to the building, you will see that this part of the ceiling is, is nice and complete. The other side is left incomplete. And that wasn't because they ran out of money in 1949 or 1950 when they built the room. It was left uncompleted because this is the work of Economic and Social Council, that the work of this organization, the work that we need to continue to do to improve our economic and social well-being is a never-ending task, unlike the Trusteeship Council, which has a complete ceiling and it, it completed its task. Uh, the Security Council hopefully one day will, will also complete its task. But the planet and the reference to the planet is something that I wanted to go back to. Uh, is we had Steven Pinker here as a, the first inaugural speaker of the President of General ECOSOC uh, speech, and he spoke about his book, Enlightenment Now, and how we live in the best age in the history of humanity in terms of the, the, how, how long we can live, the economic indicators, et cetera, et cetera. And I think we, we, we also hosted him in the bookshop, and, and my question to him in the bookshop was that we've done very well for humans, but if we were sitting here representing other species, it would be a completely different discussion. We have led a world into the extinction of thousands of species, and there are th reports that by the end of this century, more than existing half of the species that we know today will be extinct. So we need to think more than just our own and innovation for our own good. And innovation can also go both ways. Like a knife, we can chop an onion in a knife, and also we can stab somebody. And the same thing that goes for the knife can go for the digital world in which we, we now inhabit. So let me now turn to, uh, I know we have a group of young uh, students uh, with us who would like to, a new generation who are more familiar with technology than we are, uh, will turn to them to give one sentence each. And I hope that they will stick to the one sentence so that we can have a, I know we are half an hour behind uh, the schedule, so they can give you some room. So these, uh, these voices of youth, I call on Sam Vagar, Executive Director and Co-Founder of the Millennium Campus Network to say something, and then we will move to the students. Sam? Good afternoon. Can you all hear me? Excellent. Um, so I'll try and be uh, very brief. and. Um, <clears throat> Mahar, I do want to thank you. You asked us to read the, the preamble together. Um, and on Charter Day, to do that, um, <clears throat> I just want to, there was one part that stood out to me, uh, which was to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person. And I would ask all of us today, do our politics, do our discourse actually uphold that vision and values? 
to reaffirm fundamental human rights and the dignity and worth of the human person. That charter is our North Star. It has given us a very clear mandate for where we as humanity must go. And I'm here very briefly to offer a millennial perspective uh, on what we have seen and uh, really not just in words but in actions, what is already taking place. How many of you, by a show of hands if you're able, uh, are students or work with students? Okay. So for all of you, number one, thank you. Number two, the reality is you know, the, the majority of the students uh, who will be around in 2045 probably aren't even born yet. And so it is so important to have an intergenerational dialogue on, on where we take this work next. And so I just wanted to offer a very specific look at what Millennium Fellows are doing around the world. Um, because we've built a movement, it started when I was 19 years old coming into these spaces. Uh, but not just being inspired by the spaces, but the people. And so when I was 19, we started in our college dorm rooms, the Millennium Campus Network, MCN, to help undergraduates take action on the Millennium Development Goals, now the Sustainable Development Goals. And we've helped more than 6,000 young people have concrete impact on these goals. 75% of our alumni are now in social impact careers, making a difference. And last year, we launched the partnership with the United Nations Academic Impact. Um, and we launched it in presenting the Millennium Fellowship. So it's a leadership development program. And for all of you who are students or work with students, it's a platform to provide training, connections, credentials to undergraduates making a difference on the SDGs, on UN goals. And um, really, David, something you spoke about is that need for empathy. And so our core value is what we focus on instilling in these young leaders is a commitment to empathy humility, inclusion as guiding values in this work. And if we can layer on top of that a focus on technology for social impact, uh, that is incredibly powerful. And so we had 402 Millennium Fellows graduate the program last year. Young people at Alma College in Central Michigan tackling food insecurity through aquaponics farming. Young women at Afat University in Saudi Arabia uh, who noted that the field of cybersecurity is only 20% female, and so created a digital mentorship program to support young women going into the field. And if I could spotlight just three Millennium Fellows who stood out to us, <clears throat> who are leveraging technology to realize the SDGs. An issue very close to my heart, and I'm sure many of you, when I was in middle school, I remember viscerally being bullied. I remember that experience, uh, the words that were said, the derogatory language that was used. Well, today we're not just facing physical bullying, we're facing cyberbullying. It's an epidemic. And so Carissa Shaw, a young woman at, who's studying at the University of Pennsylvania, created an organization, Cyber Sensibility. Cyber Sensibility has created an experiential curriculum to help middle schoolers who are tackling cyberbullying. It's now being used by 1,200 middle schoolers across the United States. And with the power of this network, with the Millennium Fellowship, it's actually been adapted and localized. Adapted and localized in India and Nigeria. And so to just close with two other examples, one in India, uh, her colleagues who are localizing this curriculum also have their own initiatives. Nadeem Mohammed Shah Jahan, uh, along with colleagues Sarath Shahji, has created Aggravator. An aggravator uh, in India is focused on SDG 13. So it's working on countering two major threats agriculture faces today. The lack of rainfall and depleted underground water. And it's a project that uses advanced automated irrigation system to find the amount of water required for the plant using different parameters and execute it. This one project uses AI to predict the adequate amount of water supply that would be required to support optimal growth. That's a project that's benefiting 150 people today. Uh, and the last project I wanted to highlight, Philemon Kuza with the Opus Campus and Open Campus Initiative at the University of Ibadan in Nigeria. He identified a simple problem. Students are producing research papers in Nigeria and around the world. But a lot of times, those research papers, all that knowledge, ends up sitting on a shelf. 
So what if you could create a digital platform so that students could access each other's research and draw upon it? What if you could build that community of practice? He's doing that at his university. 121 students are now involved in that project, have uploaded their research, and he wants to expand it across Nigeria. Those are just three of 402 Millennium Fellows who graduated the program last year. And we often overlook students. We write them off, we say it's just one little small project, it doesn't really matter. Well, those 402 young people, those 402 Millennium Fellows, volunteered nearly 50,000 hours last year on 214 unique projects, positively impacting the lives of 393,449 people in 13 countries. All grassroots, local solutions, local response to the challenges they saw. This year, Thanks to the United Nations Academic Impact, we've had over 7,000 applications from 850 campuses in 135 countries. That is a movement. That is what young people are doing. We don't have to sit around and ask ourselves, are young people stepping up to actually affirm the vision and values of the Charter? They're doing that work. We all know that. That's why we're here. And so I would just say, as a millennial, we, we have to tap into both our intellectual imagination but marry it with our moral imagination, uh, really for restorative acts for humanity to make that charter real. And so what we're building with the Millennium Fellowship in proud partnership with the United Nations Academic Impact is a global community of practice to tackle, to take action, accelerate action, to make the SDGs reality. We'd be honored to collaborate with each and every one of you and really honored to be with you today. Thanks so much. Thank, thank you, Sam. And I think it's really great to hear all of these positive stories and, and, and incredible contributions. Just going back to something David said, that the United Nations should reinvigorate the visceral experience of hope. Hope is something that actually motivates us. And, and I know that fear and anger can get uh, viral on the internet, but we need, our job is to make hope and hope for a better future do the same. So let me now turn, uh, we're lucky to have with us students from around the world who are in the United States for the annual Global Solutions Laboratory organized by Global Education Motivators, GEM, and their interpret leaders, uh, Madard Gable and Wayne Jacoby. Thank you for being with us. So we've asked the students to share with us, ideally in a single sentence, uh, the technological or scientific breakthrough that they visualize or hope for to help the United Nations in fulfilling its mission in the year 2045. So let's uh, first invite Gurinder Singh. Gurinder? Yep. Your sentence. So, uh, tech, uh, technology for now needs to, uh, as we see the main, uh, the main problem for today's world is climate change. So, I aspire uh, te uh, technologies to develop in this field and uh, deal with this main issue that is being developed right now. Thank you, uh, Gurinder. Uh, now I invite Fustin. CP Shimbu. Thank you. Uh, I'm from the Democratic Republic of Congo, and uh, uh, in Congo we have a lot of issues with uh, clean water and um, electricity. So I hope that the technology in uh, 2045 will bring the clean water to all the population around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Fustin. Uh, I now invite Ati Chang. Thank you. Hello. Yeah, thank you. Uh, addressing the need of youth empowerment uh, in order to make them current and future global citizens that, and that can actually contribute with good ideas, good decisions, good action on the ground. I think there is a need to develop or use existing applications and social networks on which youths are really, really engaged in order to teach them or raise their awareness on global issues on which the UN is working, such as peace, climate change, poverty, and education. Thank you. 
Thank you, and I invite you to look at the agenda, Youth 2030, the agenda for the UN strategy for youth uh, that was launched from this room about a, in September of last year. Uh, I hope it will have elements that you were looking for. Thank you, Ati. Uh, now I invite Fawaz Ali Khan. Thank you. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yeah. So I think uh, climate change is like one of the most dire topics in the world right now, and not many people know about that. So it would be better for, for, for by the help of technology, we can spread awareness in the world about climate change and help people prevent the mm -hmm. inevitable doom. Thank Th you. Thank you. Thank you, Fawaz. It is one of the top priorities for the Secretary General, and, and he is hosting a climate action summit on the 23rd of September, and everybody is invited to mobilize around the world uh, around that day and before to focus attention on climate change. It is definitely an existential threat, we agree. I invite uh, now Zogori Moni Audrey Lad. Lade? I'm uh, sorry for slaughtering your name. Um, my interest here is about um, human trafficking. The very top priority, and I hope is um, there by then, is accessible and available quality education for everybody. I think that is key to anything we want to do, any step we want to further. Education and awareness um, is what empowers women, men, children to do something and accomplish something. Uh, specifically, the way the world is going, I think with an emphasis on mental health, um, would be very, very key to the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And indeed, uh, and I like that if you didn't say education, you said quality education, because that is, there's a difference between any education and quality education. And still, there are 60 million children who do not attend school today. Thank you very much for that. So all of you have now enriched our program with your voices, and, and I think it's, it's, maybe we've done a good job on climate change. Most of you mentioned climate change, and I think the others are impactful as well. Uh, and, and I think this is something that we really believe in is needed to to mobilize not just con governments, private sector, academic institutions, everybody is, is indeed too. Uh, I'm looking at the time, we have about less than 15 minutes, but I would like to still to open the floor for any comments, uh, discussion from the floor, uh, if you have any burning question that you'd like to address to the panel members. Yes, uh, please. Can, yes, can please. I see hands? Well, okay, uh, one and two, we'll take, you and then yeah, press the button when it's red, you can speak and identify yourself, please, and try to be brief. Thanks. Hi, um, can everyone hear me? Mm -hmm. um, my name is Jacqueline Tran, um, and I'm an anthropologist. I've been long very interested in sort of the cultural, um, uh, cultural phenomenon that both inform and also surround technology. Um, while I do think it's very fascinating and wonderful that you have all these um, efforts by uh, your sort of millennial network campus group to um, kind of mobilize young people to uh, take initiative, from personal experience I've also seen that um, within the internet age you also have an oversaturation of information which has caused sort of contemporary complacency amongst um, young people have driven them to sort of lose faith in governments and formal institutions. Uh, Fabrizio mentioned that restructuring governance systems for the digital age is necessary because we still live in, a, um, I guess still operate in ones in which uh, we still are kind of working within the nuclear age. And so I guess my question is, or more of like a, um, my question is if you could speak to the sorts of ways in which um, anybody on the panel, um, you could speak to the ways in which we can mobilize young people to sort of go beyond that uh, contemporary complacency, um, not just by having, uh, I guess, um, literacy, um, like digital literacy, but to actually in, uh, create enthusiasm mm -hmm. um, to uh, involve critical thinking skills, to be involved in policy, to actually make that difference, not just kind of look at our screen, see that there was another, you know, something that had happened around the world and not really do anything about it. Um, if you could have any thoughts about that, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Let's gather uh, all the questions in one go and then we can have, uh, please, yes. Yes. So my name is uh, Professor Dr. Cowan. I am from Toro College and I would like to um, ask the question to the whole panel. Uh, in regards to surveillance capitalism, 
I just wrote a paper on biometric privacy concerns in virtual and augmented reality spaces in regards to tier one companies. Do you have any thoughts about um, surveillance capitalism and how dangerous you find that particular phenomena for the collective futures of students who might be using in-world spaces? Thank you. Uh, okay. Go ahead. Thank you so much. I am Birjan Ünver and I represent the Light Millennium Organization. Uh, I have, yes, two burning questions. One is in reference to internet uh, control or global protocol of internet uh, because Ms. Fres has mentioned that it's impossible. Uh, I wonder that especially UNJ and Security Council hand in hand can come up with a global protocol for internet for preventing dark business, uh, drug trafficking, uh, human trafficking, all that it's been mentioned. That's the one burning question or uh, an idea if that could be work towards to that UN could come up with a global constitution for internet. The second is 50% of the youth is today and next uh, 10, 20 years uh, more be unemployment. But the more um, disappointing parts of that, even though today when we talk about good quali quality education, master degrees uh, students in the world, in the US, they can get the job, they really work hard, pay hard, and have to pay that maybe next 20 years. What, we are wasting the human resources. What are the solutions? Especially we are here talking about celebrating the UN Charter and academic impact, and there is a really serious issue which doesn't come up table enough. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, oh, One please. One last question. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> the time is already here when AI will overpower human capability. Think about the Boeing 737 MAX. To what extent can the UN lead a movement so that humans will always be able to override technology in the interest of safety? Thank you. Uh, we got caught up with the time, so I just want to maybe ask David to give us some remarks, concluding remarks from all of what you've heard and, and address any of the questions that were asked and I will uh, address some of the ones maybe asked to the UN. Sure. Um, so the first question about the lack of civic engagement. Uh, I think that is increasingly a challenge for open societies and part of it is why, why would anyone be motivated to civic engagement in the first place? And I think, again, if, if we recall the history of how the UN came to be, it was because people saw how bad things could get. And so I'm a big believer that sometimes past successes can set yourselves up for future failures. And so in some respects, a lot of open societies have achieved a high standard of living. Things are fairly good. And so you, you have a generation that is not necessarily aware of how bad things could be. And so part of it is maybe one, recognizing that, in, by and large, those that are even able to ask that question are already fairly privileged, and maybe they need to have a responsibility to give back. But then, two, recognize that there may be forces at work, internal or external, that are trying to demotivate you to do anything. And, and, and it's not to take the, the view that you should take a stand and only believe that your way is the right way for civic engagement. It is getting to the idea of empathy. What I really would like are bridge builders, because I think especially in open societies right now, technology is fragmenting us, it's making us more lonely, it's making us think somehow we're more connected because we somehow have 3,000 friends on some platform, but at the same time we've actually lost those actual bridges. And so I would recommend how do you motivate people to get engaged? Find something you care about, find something you think is needing to be fixed, but then in addition to being passionate about that, 
uh, also adopt what President Lincoln said in, our, in the United States, which is, I do not like that man or woman. I must get to know them better. Make sure you understand the other side of whatever the challenges are as well. And, but I also recognize that that's an open society question. Some societies don't have that. Uh, I'm going to now jump to the surveillance capitalism question and what might be happening in AI, um, AR. So there are three doors in which this technological future may unfold itself. It was kind of implicit that I was suggesting that the world is increasingly getting instrumented with network devices. Uh, we could have easily talked about that the next five or so years, the amount of low Earth orbit satellites that are going to be launched are going to double. And so these stats do matter because they are instrumenting the planet at unprecedented levels. Now there's huge possibilities for that because we can monitor what's happening to the climate, we can create greater awareness, but it also presents three possible doors. One is the door of surveillance state, that basically everything you do is always being watched. And in some respects, there are some countries that may make the choice that they're okay with that because that gets to safety, that they feel more safe living in that environment. Uh, there's also the case of surveillance capitalism, which is the free market making value off that data. There are going to be some people that are willing to download that free app or download that free thing in exchange for that service. My concern is that's not a conscious choice or an informed choice. So that gets to door number three, which is the planet's going to get instrumented. Um, short of a uh, major catastrophe, the planet is getting instrumented with technological devices. But what we need to do is give people, I come from public health, choice and in information so they can be more aware of when they make those choices. And again, those choices aren't except all or nothing. It's a resistat as to I'm willing to share this data in exchange for that or I'm not willing to, but I'm willing to pay for the service. And the only way you can actually address that is provide compelling alternatives. You can't just say X is bad or that platform is bad if there's nothing else that takes its place. Uh, and so if you're interested, People's Internet, we are actually investing in different possibilities to actually show alternative models. But it doesn't have to just be us. It can be anyone in the world. Show a different way forward for door number three. Um, the question about Internet security. Um, so I work for Vint Cerf, who was one of the people that actually helped create uh, TCP IP, the Internet Protocol. He would say TCP IP was never meant to be a final standard. It was actually meant to be updated on a regular basis, and unfortunately we have not. Um, that said, um, just like in the real world, we do our best to have security around this building, but nothing's going to guarantee that nothing wrong is ever going to happen. The same is true with the Internet. Um, and so I think there needs to be discussions about, in the real world and in the physical world, if you want something to be open, secure, and private, you can probably get two of the three, but you probably can't get all three. And then how do you balance that? Uh, job creation, I think that is, a, that is going to become a big thorny issue for the next 10 years uh, around the world, if it's not already. And to me, I think it's recognizing we've been through this before. Um, agricultural societies, you work 24-7. And it was a major transition when you went from working in agricultural society to industrial societies, where you were still working long hours, 12 hours, six, six days a week. But there was a fundamental shift, and, and there's some theorists that say that the way we humans dealt with that, unfortunately, was through alcohol and uh, other approaches, is that was the social sedative that helped us bridge that gap. Then when we went from working in some places, from working in factories six days a week, 12 hours, to working in more knowledge worker settings, which I recognize is not the case for everybody in the world, there's also some that say we dealt with that through sitcoms. So we humans have been moving inequitably, of course, unfortunately not equitably around the world as a whole, we've been moving to working less and less hours. In some respects that's good. The bad news is we humans need a sense of purpose. And so what I would say, it's, it's both a question of how do you address the fact that jobs are being destroyed and it's unclear at the rate that new jobs will be created. More jobs may be created eventually, but the question is what's the lag effect? But it's more a question of where do you get your sense of identity and purpose? And so much of what we've tied up right now is your identity and purpose comes from your job. I would submit we need to find alternatives that link your identity and purpose to communities and working in the communities, whether that's a vocation or an advocation. And that's a conversation that I think the United Nations could have. Um, but I won't, I'll, I'll leave you to decide whether or not you take it on. Lastly, AI and security. Again, this is where we need to have a conversation about what is that third door that is neither surveillance state nor surveillance capitalism. And again, some places will pick one of those doors um, because they are willing to be more safe in an era in which everything is being watched. 
Other places will not pick that. And I don't think we can say one size fits all for the world. But what we can do is at least have conversations and possibly encourage projects that are door number three for those that want to take up the mantle of open societies that are still pluralistic, recognizing that the world is being instrumented, but we want you to have decision and choice in that space. Thank you. Thank, thank you, David. Uh, and I think before I, I just give maybe a final comment on, on some of the questions, uh, our gratitude, of course, to the Boston Global Forum for its support, and in particular to Mr. Nagian A. Tuan, co-founder and director of the Michael Dukakis Institute for Leadership and MDI, and co-founder and CEO of Boston uh, BGF, and also to Governor Dukakis himself. I would also like to maybe thank uh, people who haven't been named uh, in passing, maybe Ramu Damodaran, uh, Lanise Collins, Fernando, Jane, and Matthew. Please stand up. Thank you. Uh, these are the ones who have worked behind the scene, have put this event together, and I think we owe them a great debt of gratitude. Uh, maybe just to the questions about what the United Nations can do and what the United Nations cannot do. The United Nations is not a world government. The United Nations is a forum for governments to come, and it is based, I mean, governments are sovereign in their own right. It is based on the collective agreement of these sovereign governments to come together and try to find global solutions to global problems. And in today's world, we see the problems becoming more and more global that no one country can deal with alone. So this important, the importance of this platform is more than any time before. So within different governments, they have regulations that dictate how they work within those. And some of those regulations, in most cases, are informed or related to an international convention that has been reached here. And some of those agreements lead to big successes. We talk about climate change, and I think it's, the Paris Agreement was a major step, but of course the Paris Agreement put us on the way to a solution, not quite, because we were really uh, decades behind in, in trying to reach it. The Katowice uh, COP meeting uh, last November, or December uh, actually, uh, created the roadmap for achieving Paris, and we see a lot of movement on that. Are we there? No. And this is why the Secretary General is holding a Climate Action Summit this year. And that Climate Action Summit is inviting leaders of government, leaders of private sector, le leaders of financial institutions, leaders of civil society, academic, to come together with solutions. You do not come to that summit to make a speech. The Secretary General does not want to hear speeches. He wants to hear actions and he wants to hear commitments and that will get us to the change we do. To give you a positive example to what can be done, for those of you young people here, you will not remember the early 1980s, what was on everybody's mind was the ozone layer, the, the manufacturing of certain uh, chemicals that we used in industry was eroding the ozone layer, which was growing, and uh, sun rays and, and ultraviolet lights was causing cancers and was seen as a problem that is not, not easy to do. Then within the framework of the United Nations, the Montreal Protocols were, uh, were concluded and regulations were in stipulated that basically prevented certain chemicals from being used. And today we see that the ozone layer has actually is healing. So that was a major problem and that was a solution that member states and industry came together and found it. So when there is a will, there's a way. And I think this is where ending on this story of hope. We can work together to achieve things that we can, we can all aspire will improve our collective lives in the future. Thank you for being with us this afternoon, and, and I really, truly want to thank all the panel members, uh, excellent contributions. Hope to see you again back at the UN and to continue these discussions on SDGs in academia. Thank you.